Good evening, St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church family and friends who are gathered on the um, Zoom line as well as those who are gathered on the phone line. It is wonderful to see each of you today. I uh, pray that you had a wonderful day in the Lord and that you um, uh, uh, experienced the very presence of God in different aspects of your life. Oh, we are here tonight in the celebrating our expectation moment. Mother Vaughn, tell me how many days it's been. If you would shoot me a text, I appreciate it. <laughs> of how many days we've been here. You can you can just shout it out if you want to. 933 days. 933 days. Thank you, Mother Vaughn. Mother Vaughn is, is our keeper of records and um, days. <laughs> 933 days of living in expectation. We're mighty grateful for that and the, the, what God has done for us and how God has spoken to us for these 933 days. I'm still amazed. I'm still grateful that God gave the instruction I'm grateful that you, we all have um, heeded uh, the call and been responsive for these days. And I'm amazed at how God has elevated, strengthened, grown us during this season. So I'm mighty grateful for that. Paul has done a fantastic job of of, of expressing and convincing us about mankind's need for um, God's glorious, man's need for salvation, God's glorious provision uh, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and giving us all that we need uh, for salvation and a life in him and with him. Um, now, it, it is as if Paul is ask, answering an unasked question. Remember, Paul wrote this letter while he was in Corinth, so he was not even in contact with the Roman Christians. And somebody said, maybe he knew somebody there. No, he didn't. He had never been to Rome. So maybe he didn't know anybody there. And if he did, they did not give him any insight as to what was going on. No, Paul's interaction was with God. God uh, spoke to Paul and gave him these words to express the need of mankind, God's method of delivering mankind and the benefit of God's presence by the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave us very clarity on, on God's work. Jesus's work and the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Now here in chapter nine through chapters 11, um, the unanswered question is, and, and, and that, that God answers and, and declares to Paul is, wait a minute, I hear you say that nothing can separate us from the love of God, but what about the Jews? What about God's chosen people? What about those people uh, that God set aside even before they were ever a nation and chose them to be his own? What about them? If God has lost them, they have rejected him. If God has lost them, how much how much confidence can we have in that in God delivering and keeping us? That that was that was what Paul is prepared now to declare and even answer the question that wasn't answered in chapters nine through eleven. Why? Because God told him to. God says, "Listen, I want you to tell them. I want to make this thing plain. I want them to understand for two reasons why Israel is Israel." and how the deliverance will come to pass. As a matter of fact, every time I thought about and read chapters 9 through 11, I'm more convinced about the real power of God to save and deliver his people. In other words, Israel at this time had rejected um, Christ as Savior. The truth is, they're still in that place now. But God's plan of salvation is not disrupted by Israel. If I could do a station break, God's plan for salvation is not even disrupted by us. Because how many of us ran from salvation? How many of us were... Were, 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 were thoughtful about other things. How many of us may not have started off the way God wanted to start off, yet God reached us? That's because of the power of God's love that Paul expressed in the last verses of chapter 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. But Paul begins now, and, it's, and, and, and I said this a few nights ago, at chapter 8, Paul was full of the Spirit and moving. Now he's full of the Spirit, um, but his, his response is a little different. It's tempered. Uh, it's measured. So let's just read. Um, beginning in chapter 9, verse 1, so that we can begin to see um, what was happening here uh, in Paul's heart during this time. Paul starts off uh, in chapter 9, verse 1. He says this, and I'm going to really make a good effort to slow down because I get really excited, but I, wanna, I want us to understand this because this is critical. Uh, I, as I read this today, I'll be honest with you, I was more and more convinced of the certainty of our salvation. I'm convinced, but I'm saying I could see it clearer uh, after having read some of these verses, chapter nine, verse one, Paul says, I save the truth in Christ. Paul is, is, is using the strongest terms possible to express to his readers and to us that what he's about to say is coming from his heart. 
He says, I'll say the truth in Christ. He letting us know in the strongest possible term that what he is saying is something that God has laid on his heart. Paul says, I'm not lying. Look at chapter one, nine, verse one. I lie not. He said, my conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. Paul says, what I'm telling you is how I feel after at be, being moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I thought about this and the Lord kind of, the Lord showed me a few things about this verse. Paul's burden, despite all the great news he had expressed in chapters one through eight, Paul's burden, Paul's desire, Paul's concern was not even about Paul. Paul uses chapter nine, verse one to make very plain that what he is saying, he really means. And he furthermore underscores it by saying that the Holy Spirit, who he had just said in chapter eight, bear witness to our spirit that we are children of God. He said the Holy Spirit is his witness and in in, in, in that he is telling the truth. That's what he's saying. Now, what exactly is Paul heavy about? What is his conscience um, heavy about? What is he concerned about? What is his worry? What is he, because it almost sounds like Paul is sad. Matter of fact, if you read all the way through this, it does sound like Paul is sad. What is he sad about? Verse two says, Paul said, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Paul says, I can't even sleep at night, really. He says, I'm always thinking about this one thing. Paul says, what I'm talking about, I promise I'm telling you the truth. I'm not playing with y'all. The Holy Spirit will bear me witness that what I'm dealing with is a great heaviness. He didn't say he was just heavy. He said a great heaviness and not just sorrow, but a continuing sorrow. In other words, Paul could not shake the heaviness and the sorrow that he felt. But the question is, Paul, what you heavy and sorry about? Sorrowful about? Paul says, verse three, for I, wish, I could wish, Paul said, I wish that myself, that me, Paul says, I wish I were cursed or disconnected from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul says, what makes me heavy, and, 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 I, and he didn't even explain it yet, but he says, I wish that myself could be disconnected from Christ if my brethren, my kinsmen, those who are part of the family of Jews um, would be saved. That's what he says. I wish that myself were cursed for Christ, for my brother. Paul says, if I could take the place, I think about that. Paul says, if I could lose Christ and they could gain Christ, Paul said, that would make me satisfied because he said, I'm heavy and I'm, I'm sorrowful because of the fact that my brethren in the flesh, those who are kinsmen by uh, virtue of being Jews, but he was heavy because they had not received the gift of God through Christ into salvation, unto salvation. Paul it further explains who he's sorry for or who he, why he's sorry. He's not even sorry for them. He's sorry. He was sorry for in himself. Verse four, he says, who are Israelites? And he's not, and he stopped there, but then he, he paused. But he said, they're not just Israelites. They just not, don't just, they don't just have a name. He says, they're not just a named people. Paul said, they got some other stuff. Paul, what they got? Paul says, to whom pertaineth the adoption. Paul says that God has chosen these people. He says, and the glory. They have experienced the Shekinah glory of God. They experienced the power and the presence of God. And the covenants, God, he says, God loved them so much that he made covenant with these people. He said, not only that, but he gave them the law and the service of God and the promises. They saw God act on their behalf. Paul says, my brethren, the Israelites, whom God has given all these things. Verse five, he moves on and continues to express who they are. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerned the flesh Christ came, who is over all God bless forever. Amen. He says that in Christ's coming, his work was to fulfill that which the fathers were promised. And he said, I'm sorry in my heart. I'm heavy in my heart because this group of people who I'm related to by blood have not received Christ as their savior. Paul said, my heaviness becomes from the Jews, my kinsmen, having not accepted Christ, who was is in fact given for them. Paul says, I can't sleep. I got a headache. I'm frustrated. And I would I would lose. He said, if I if me losing Christ would cause me to gain Christ, Paul says, that's how important this is to me. And I don't know what to say. I mean, this if this isn't the love of God, I don't know what it is. Paul says, I want other people to know God the same way I do, even if I lost Christ because I've known him. Paul says, that's how bad I want people. Do you see the power God evangelistic spirit? Chapter one, he says it. Paul wants people to know Christ. And you know, and the more I thought about it, the reason why Paul didn't allow his external circumstances to defeat him, the reason why Paul didn't allow his beatings at Berea, his being chastised and 
prosecuted and persecuted. The reason why Paul never let anything worry him is because his real focus, his real heart was on people coming to Christ. Can I say that? That was what he was concerned about. And the more I thought about it in the practical sense, if the church, and I've been, I've been the pastor here, if the church is more focused on people coming to Christ, a lot of the little stuff we worry about wouldn't even bother us. It wouldn't even, it, we wouldn't even be frustrated. A lot of the things that we were, if we woke up in the morning saying, how can I, how can I reach somebody for Christ? We wouldn't worry about what our friends said about us, our cousins, our neighbors. We wouldn't worry about what we're going through if our hearts and minds were fixed on praying, reaching other people for Christ. Church the worries about all other stuff if the church doesn't have the power that God has for us to have. The person that is always fixated on little things does not have the capacity to do those great things that God wants us to do. We worry. I think I may have told y'all this story a long time ago, but I'm going to tell it again. And this kind of, to me, um, and this is probably one of the greatest memories I had of my dad. I have of my dad. And I had a lot of great memories, but this is the one that sticks out of my head. My dad was in West Face Fair Hospital, which is closed now, just in case you move to Atlanta. It's not there anymore. But when he was there, he was on the cancer floor. He had leukemia. And um, and, and during that time, um, they had, you know, kind of, you know, told him, they had told him um, his prognosis wasn't very good. And one day I came to the hospital. Um, was my mom would stay all night and then I would stay all day. And I came in the morning and I couldn't find my dad. So I was looking all around for him and asked the nurse, I said, where's my dad? Because I thought something had happened. And they said, well, he was in the room. So I'm like, well, where, did he, where could he go? So I'm walking up and down the halls and finally I hear his voice. And I dug my head in the room and he was sitting there with his little, I don't know what you call it, Reverend Nelson, a little thing you carry with your little IVs on it. He was carrying that and he was sitting there talking to the man and the man was in the bed and, and, and my dad was just, the man was riveted and my dad was just sharing him about Christ. And so, you know, I didn't want to interrupt him. So I went back to his room and so when he walked back down the hall, I said, what are you doing? He said, I was, I'm, he said, that man down there real sick. <laughs> he said, I had to tell him about Jesus. And I looked at him and I said, well, you, you know, you said too, right? He said, yeah, but I know Jesus. And, and, and that to me summed up the whole situation. He wasn't worried about sick, his sickness because he was worried about somebody else knowing Jesus Christ. I want us to understand. I'm saying this not just because my dad. I'm saying this not just because of Paul. I'm saying this because it's the reality. As Christians, our hearts need to be more bent for what people know in Christ than anything else. What size building we have, that's, you know, that's it is what it is. But that ought not be our main focus. Our main focus ought not be paint colors and carpet. But we got to get carpet and paint colors. I'm not saying we should, but that shouldn't be our priority. Because I believe if our priority is reaching people for Christ, everything else that God wants and has for us will come to pass. I give an example. During this season of pandemic, as we sat faithfully and listened to the word of God every night, God, in his majestic power, gave us all that we needed to take care of the business around this church. That wasn't that wasn't because we everybody got new jobs with new raises. Did anybody get I ain't getting no raise during the pandemic? Well, that's not true. Y'all gave me a raise. But I'm talking about I didn't get no I didn't, I didn't, I'm, don't let me say that because that's that the Lord has blessed me. But what I'm saying is it ain't that everybody in the church just got millions of dollars. That's not what happened. God, out of the riches of his resources, gave us what we needed. Would anybody agree with that? Out of his riches of glory in Christ Jesus, gave us what we need because we're faithful to him. Now I want to add to that. As Christians, I want us to add to that and let us be proud for daily all the time, looking not just for the church, but for the church, but just for ourselves to have an opportunity for somebody to come to Christ. In these first uh, five verses, Paul shares with us his real attitude about Christians, about more Christians, about people coming to Christ. And again, as I talk about it, I used to wonder how Paul dealt with that stuff. Because, you know, I'll be honest with you, sometimes, you know, you get beat up enough, like Paul, you might say, I'm going to take a break. Paul never took a break. Why? Because he wasn't worried about getting beaten up. Because Paul said, if I'm getting beaten up for Christ, it's worth it. Paul said, if I, if I die for Christ, Paul said it's worth it. The heart of Christians should be bent toward others coming to Christ. So in his introductory five verses in chapter nine, Paul establishes his, his passion, but also the passion of God, but also the power in the plan of God. So I'm, I'm going to say that God's plan is revealed here in this chapter because Paul is letting us know that we have no need to fear the certainty of our salvation because God even though these people rejected him, has a plan to deliver them as well. So now as I move forward, I want us to be watchful on each of these verses because each of these verses, we read them 
and, and reflect on them and be prayerful about them reveal to us yet another reason that we can trust God. I, I promise you, I read this today and I had another reason, no, another reason to add to the other reasons I trust God. Let's look at verse six. Paul says, not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Paul says, I'm not saying in all that the word of God didn't impact them because the word of God is, is, it, it is what it is and does what God has promised it would do. Paul said, I want to also establish that the challenge is not, um, um, and, and, and he said, I'm, I'm in, and I guess Paul was really saying this. He said, uh, I'm not even, I want somebody who's looking at Israel and saying, oh, God's word to come through. He said, I want you to understand that, that and, and somebody might say, well, God, the, the, the people of Israel, the people of God missed the Messiah, and now they're cursed. And how can they think, how do I know that's not going to happen? Paul says, I want you not to worry about that. He said, they're not, he said right here, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Paul says this. He says, um, "Word, y'all know the word Israel means governed by God. And Paul says here that not all Israel is governed by God. Paul said it ain't everybody that's disconnected from God. Paul says um, that some are in fact governed by God. And, and, and those who are governed by God actually are Israel. You know, in other words, he's saying, just think about this. Think about it. A bunch of people ran in there and put on St. Peter's shirts. And, and some of the folk were out there praying for folks. Some of the folks were out there witnessing folks. And some of the folk out there were robbing and knocking people in the head. We would know that the people, though, even though they had on St. Peter's shirt, they weren't from St. Peter. They were doing what? Robbing and knocking people on the head. Paul says that just because some of these people from Israel don't they mean they are governed by God. That's what Paul is saying. He says, so before anybody can say, well, you know, the people of Israel, he said everybody didn't turn their back on God. Everybody did not reject God. He said only those who are not governed by God. Verse seven says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He says this right here. He said, um, he's saying God's word didn't fail because God still reaches his children of promise. All right. You remember how we talked about um, in Hebrews, especially about how uh, Abraham received the promise and how we also moved on to recognize that Isaac was the child of promise. Despite the fact that God had even told uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, God had told Abraham to, to kill Isaac. God, God believed, Abraham believed God and God gave him ram in the bush. Why? Because that was a child of promise. God wasn't going to take that away. What he's saying here is that despite the fact that Abraham had another son, Isaac was the child of promise. What does that mean today? That those who God promises and chooses and elects and calls, those are always going to be here. No matter what. So in Israel, there are those who at that time and even now have chosen Christ as Savior, despite the fact that all their brothers and sisters uh, may reject Christ. They're still those who are governed by God a, and that who are the children of promise, um, the children of promise and, the, and those who um, are, are governed by God is not defined by the title Israel. They are defined by their faith and trust and belief in God. That's what he is. is he's, a, he's making this very plain. He says that just being a descendant of Abraham does not make you saved. Because being a child of Abraham only works if you have faith as well. He talked about that uh, in Hebrews. He's letting us know that that just because a person is from Israel don't mean that 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 they are saved or, or, or accept Christ. But also don't mean that the people who call Israel, they're not some who accept Christ despite what their brother, brethren are doing. Paul says, um, um, verse 80 says this, that is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God. He had just said this now in chapter 7, chapter 8. Those who follow the flesh are what? After the flesh. You're talking about us. He's saying the same thing about children of Israel. If you follow the flesh, you're, you're a child of flesh. But if you follow God and anybody who was following God, despite the fact they were in Israel, they would follow God's promise and recognize it was actually found in Jesus. See, the problem was at the time of Paul's writing, the Jewish and the same thing is true. They could not comprehend, understand, accept, or receive Jesus as Savior because they were looking for somebody else. They were looking for a military leader. They were looking for a political leader. They were looking for a governmental leader. They were looking for somebody with a level of power. Jesus didn't come like that. We know that. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. We know that. He was born in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and laid in the manger. We know that that's where he, how he came. And so they never could in their minds conceptualize because they have this great picture that's not the proper picture. 
they they didn't listen to Isaiah and the other prophets, letting them know how Jesus will come. And so what he's saying is the people who are children of God understand it and received it. But those who didn't, didn't. Let's go back to John chapter three for a minute. Um, the man Nicodemus was a Jewish ruler, yet he sought out Jesus. Now we know he came to Jesus by night, but he did seek out Jesus because what? He was, a, he was obviously chosen by God and a child of God to, to know and be able to determine. And listen to this, he was able to identify and determine that Christ was in fact the Savior. Y'all remember that his conversation with Jesus? The same thing is was true, not just with Nicodemus, but throughout Israel. And the same is true today. You, we might ask ourselves, what made you join the church? You might have thought you thought it was the right time, but that was why you joined the Spirit of God led you, and and because He had chosen you to come and 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 respond to the calling of God. Whatever church you came to, whatever hour you came down, whatever preacher you shook hands with, whatever uh, moment that you shook the deacon's hands, got your name written down, wherever it was, guess what? You responded to God's call. And Paul is saying the same thing here. Um, very clearly uh, to those believers that, 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 that for those who may challenge what God did with Israel, let them know God's promise did not fail and God's people are always going to be him. Verse, I'll read verse eight again. That is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The children of promise, they're going to get what's theirs because they are the chosen, they elect, and they're going to be, for, and what God has promised will be fulfilled in their lives. Let me read three more verses. Verse nine says this. Well, this is the word of promise. Paul, what's the word of promise? Paul said, here it is right here. I'm coming at the point of time and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also have seed by one, even by Father Isaac, he says the promise is that A, Sarah's going to have a son. But then also, because remember, Isaac was old when he had a son. What God is saying is, and I love that context. I might preach that one day, that when God says something, it's going to come to pass. It might not come to pass when we want it to, but it came to pass. Isaac was an older man when he had his son, Jacob. All this is saying is the promise is what God says, that I'm going to do this. And it came to pass. Verse 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. That, again, is a reminder to us. We are not saved because we were good. So before you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I deserve to be saved, you don't. It was all, None of us do. It was a grace gift. It was an unmerited gift from God by faith in which we received Jesus to save you. We hadn't done no good when we got called. We hadn't done nothing right. We hadn't done a list of, of great works for the Lord. We were called because God loved us. Finally, it says in verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the young. Again, that's what was told to Rebecca, that 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 um, her son Ishmael would serve Jacob again. Why? We talked about this. It was what God said. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. There it is. In this one verse, God shows how he makes good on his promise. Who he loves, he chose, he chooses. We just saw that. Whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed. Who he predestined, he called. He called, he justified. And who he justified, he glorified. Out of God's love, he called Israel. And remember that part. Out of God's love, he called us. And so Paul now is beginning the, the, the platform of declaring and establishing that in fact, God's plan of salvation is intact because not one person who God intended to follow him has left the fold. Some left the fold because they weren't supposed to be there anyway. But God's promise to Israel held true at the time of the writing of this letter in the, to the book to the Church of Rome, and it holds true today. We're just we're just one page, we're just what 13 verses in, but it's going to get better and better, allowing us to know how much we can trust God. What it makes me think is I'm so glad that I was chosen. It makes me, I'm so glad that God called me and I'm grateful because of the call. And my work then is that others who've been called by God may know him and know Jesus for themselves. I'm going to stop tonight. It is 728. Uh, I thank God for each of you who've checked in tonight, 11 on the Zoom line and others who are on the phone line. But I do pray that tonight we will just again rejoice in the truth of who we are, but also rejoice in the fact that God doesn't lose anybody. When he chooses you, he calls you, you belong to him. 
and that nothing can separate us in fact from the love of God. God bless you tonight. Let us close in prayer. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we praise you. Lord, we lift you up and we magnify your name for the power of your promises and the grace and mercy you have shown all of us in Christ Jesus. God, we're resting assured tonight that you never leave, will never leave us nor forsake us. Because even though your chosen people, many rejected you, Lord, you did not, your promise still held true in the whole truth today. And because you've chosen us, your promise to us holds true today. I pray, God, that you bless every household that's represented tonight, every individual Christian, and also every individual, every family that's represented here on this Zoom and phone line tonight. I do pray, God, tonight that you would bless us by your power and by your love. I pray, God, that your word would get in our hands and feet, that we'd be more equipped to serve you. I pray, God, that your word would get in our uh, hearts, that we may be strengthened in our inner man. God, I pray that your word will get in our ears, that we can hear your word over the winds and the waves of the world. I pray, God, that your word will get on our minds. And in our, in our minds, we might have peace that surpasses all understanding. God, let your word. Let your word, your holy and righteous word, Lord, let it get on our lips, tongues, vocal cords, lungs, and throat, that we can declare your word boldly to a dying world with confidence to each other and with, with, with just humility to ourselves. That we may walk the walk you call us to walk. God bless us to have a posture of appreciation and gratefulness and praise. God bless us to have a, our hearts and minds desirous of other people knowing you and knowing Jesus as their Savior. God, build a head protection around us that the fire of darts may be, will be quenched. And then, Lord, give us uh, the thoughts and the mind and the heart to appreciate and joy and constantly worship and serve you. Lord, it's in Jesus' name. We love you. We thank you again, Lord, and ask you to give us the capacity to rejoice in you in all things. In Jesus' name, we say thank you, Lord, and amen. Hold on, Zoom line. God bless you, prayer line. <laughs>